I'm here with one of my good buddies, Dr. Josh Eldridge. How are you, man? Very good, Dave. Thanks for having me. This is cool. Yeah. So talk about coming full circle, huh? Yeah. Yep. Because I think I had you on, on one of my first podcasts. Yeah. Like, I think, like, yeah, literally one of the first podcasts ever. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's, it's funny. I was talking to the athletes that I coach and last night I was, I was like, do you guys have any nutrition questions? So I'm going to talk to Josh and then I'm talking with some other people later today and tomorrow. And so, um, they were like, I think you, you know, you've talked about that guy before. I'm like, and then I was like, wow, like six years ago we started the first ever, like, I forget how it, I think it was the podcast. Maybe it started. And then there was, I don't know what we did first. Maybe it was Congress. Maybe we met each other at Congress or we did like a seminar or something like that. But then it was like, on the road, we did like three seminars, yeah. like Maryland seminar, we're in California, like we had like a 2014 like little world tour when it all first kicked off and when I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, and same here. And I think we met the first time in Hartford is where mm -hmm. we met up at, yeah. at Congress and I was speaking on landing and jumping. Yep. And that was the first time and I had, you know, all sorts of hate mail and all that from that, but I got to meet <laughs> yeah. you and a whole bunch of other great people. At yeah, that. I also met Brian Picard that year. Mm-hmm. So Brian and I, Brian was actually the one, the, the real nostalgia is that Brian and I were, we bumped into each other after your talk and we were talking about the landing thing and then we were talking about something else and he had already caught in wind of some of the stuff that I was doing. Like he actually marched me over to the educational director and he was like, I think you guys should talk. And I was like, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> and like Brian being all, what, like six foot one of like, just like the biggest teddy bear. I was like, oh, this yeah. guy's really large, but I'll go hang out with him. <laughs> Yeah, and then the the other thing is is hair too, because I had hair just like yours, and then yeah. over the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I know just went south to my beard. It's uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh how the times have changed. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think of any good stories that we can share with people that are appropriate. Well, but, how about the one? Uh, here's one that's not too bad. But the one time when I set up the the hotel, I think we were in we were in Maryland, yeah. and like we thought that. Like I set up this hotel room and, and we're only there for seven hours, like yeah. to sleep and that's it. And so we just got one room and, and so two beds and get there and the lady's like, I'm sorry, I don't have two beds. <laughs> the worst is that we got there at two in the morning because the seminar went late and we stayed super long. And then we had dinner with everybody and we wanted to have a good experience. So it was like two in the morning and we were like, our eyes were like bleeding out. And we had to wake yeah. up at like six the next morning for day two of the seminar. Uh, no, okay, guys. I think in that same trip is when we uh, we got escorted by uh, someone in a very fast convertible that you and I thought our luggage was going to fly out of the, <laughs> <laughs> fly out of the highway. Yeah, and they, they had to fold me into the back of it. Like I was a piece of luggage in the back of that. So that was – that was. No, Josh is significantly taller than I was, than I am. So he was like, like an accordion sitting in the back seat. Yeah. And the funny thing is about that one is that was our most wild experience at a gym. Like, I don't think we've ever had such an experience, but I met someone out of that, that like was an amazing contact that mm -hmm. I've been, that I've been talking with for, for a long time about nutrition and with their gym. So I mean, it's kind of funny how like good things come out of yeah. crazy experiences. Yeah, there were definitely, uh, man, talk about the ultimate, like, flying by the seat of our pants. Like, we had all the material figured out, and we knew what we were doing. We are like, man, this stuff is super important. But even, like, when we were doing the seminars, like, there were times during the seminars when we had, like, 40 or 50 people there, and I was like, what are we doing? I was like, dude, we're talking about some of the craziest stuff, like, especially because I was still very much in my traditional gymnastics, like, mindset. You know, I was, like, nothing but I hadn't met people at Champion yet. I hadn't talked to any of the strength coaches, the physiologists, or the doctors that I work with now, and, like, I just remember being like people looking at us like some of the things we were saying, they were like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, hopefully people actually like us after this. Yeah. And I remember too, like trying to push you at the, the whole like, hey, do you think gymnastics is a little too much sometimes? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if I was the first one that did that, but I, I definitely. So. Probably. Probably, yeah. Probably on the podcast. Yeah. And I was definitely, and from my perspective is I came from a whole different side of sport. So. Yeah, right. I did other things growing up and, and I got into gymnastics because of my wife. So, oh, yeah. because she was a gymna gymnastics coach and I was just hanging out with her one night, but I had, I had no clue about the sport and I just thought it was going to be, you know, like basketball. Like when I played in college, I didn't know it was going to be its own yeah. little, little beast. And yeah. Much, yeah. So. Uh, well, it's hilarious to reminisce, but yeah, look how far we've come, huh? Yeah. Now, we were just talking a little bit before the podcast. I was like, both of us have just, we, st we stopped doing the seminars just, I think, out of necessity because you were moving jobs and you were moving to Georgia, right? And then mm -hmm. I was moving as well, moving jobs. So we fell out of touch. But uh, it's funny how, like, the, you go the other way and then you come right back to it. I, like, looked up online the other day. I'm like, oh, Josh is back. He's like, do nutrition. Oh. And I'm like, this is great because I always have a handful, like, of, like, you know, 
probably like two or three people in every area of gymnastics that are like always go to people. So Jamie Shear is a nutritionist in New York who work, who I work with. And she's, we talked on a podcast too and stuff, but there's always like a couple people here. Like these people are like, they're doing super hard work to like follow the research and they're very academic and, and you can always just trust kind of their opinion. So it's cool to kind of reconnect again. Absolutely. So, for those who maybe are newer to shift into, especially the podcast, can you give people like a, an elevator pitch on you know, your medical background and what you do with gymnasts and especially how it relates to nutrition as we're going to talk about? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, like I said, I started in gymnastics, just not meaning to, but my wife was there at the, at the gym and I was hanging out with her one night and called over for, for a back pain um, girl. And, and that's kind of where it all, all came in. And I didn't know anything about gymnastics and back pain or knee pain and heel pain and, and so as I got into gymnastics, I saw, I saw there were a lot of patterns that were going on. So, and the biggest one I saw first was heel pain. I mean, that was kind of very low hanging fruit and, and, uh, I developed a brace for that and, and a protocol to help kids with, with heel pain. And that's kind of where it all started yep. and got to, and it was, and it was things that, that I was able to bring from outside of gymnastics into gymnastics sure. and, and help people out with with protocols yep. and that's kind of how it started and i'm a big basics kind of guy so oh, yeah. if i see like like little things going on i want to see those things improve and then move on to the big stuff yeah. but um yeah so so in 2007 i got my uh, as a chiropractor we've got a couple different sports kind of certifications in 2007 i got my certified chiropractic sports physician and yep. that's a, that's kind of a postdoctoral 100 hour type course monster and, and then after I went to the Olympic Training Center to do my rotation there, I, I decided, hey, I really need to up my game a little bit. And so I went on to get my board certification in sports and really? diplomate in American Chiropractic Board Sports Physicians. And so, nice. yeah, and that's a that's a 300 hour course with, uh, I think, 100 hours of on the field training. And a lot of that was done at gymnastics. So that was really cool. And so, yeah. Yeah, so since then, I've been down here and at Fort Benning, Georgia, and mm -hmm. I, as my day job, I work with, with um, active duty Army, and, and there's also other services that come as well, but, but mainly Army. Mm -hmm. and this time of the year is very cool for me because I get to work with, with the uh, Army Rangers as they prepare for the best Ranger competition, mm -hmm. and it's really kind of cool because th they're so similar, mm -hmm. Army and gymnastics. I know it's going to sound crazy, but... <laughs> But they are, I see the same stuff going on in gymnastics that I do with, with soldiers. Mm. And there's actually very similar injuries that they have and, and the way they do things and overtraining that I'm able to apply to both. So that's kind of like my history as far as, as what I do. And I get to work at the hospital here. Uh, at yeah. Fort that's awesome, man. It's I definitely, yeah, the, I think that's where I kind of first interact with you was from Congress stuff, but like the heel, the heel, heel pain experts to severs kind of stuff. And then you and I had started talking more, but I mean, those are still stuff that I use with people every day. Like you said, it's sometimes it's just, it's really basic with, you know, the way you approach some of those things. It's not easy by any chance, but it's definitely. Right. Basic. Right. Um, and so how did you get into the nutritional stuff? Cause right now you have a book that we'll talk about that you've written and you know, you've become very, very well known for helping I'd honestly families, I would say more than the actual gymnasts themselves, but helping families approach such an important topic. So how did you get into that? Yeah, for sure. And that, that wasn't something I intended to get into. Yes. So I never, I never went out and was like, oh man, I want to talk about nutrition. Yep. But as soon as you get into the gym and you see what kids are putting into their bodies mm -hmm. and you see how confused parents are yep. and it all, it became necessity and yep. it wasn't really, it wasn't really something that I, that I went out looking for. So yep. the Severs disease was easy. Like we talked about and, and landing protocols, right? Those are, those are things that, that I really love talking about. Yep. But the nutrition is something that I have to talk about. Yeah, exactly. And that's how it came about. And, and that's why the book came about. That's why, you know, our master class came about is because parents just need help. And yeah, there's sure. so much junk out there that they're, that they're getting in mm. that's not helping their kids out at all. Mm. So one of my favorite examples, when I saw this, I was like, oh, man. Um, well, actually, I'll give you two. One was a young lady who, who her mom was so busy that – they would wind up at the fast food restaurants every night. I mean, like you name it, McDonald's, yeah. Burger King, Taco Bell, like they were, they were doing them all. Yeah. And so this girl would have days where she would have three and 4,000 calories of fast food, wow. like, like subsequent days, but then she'd feel really guilty about it. Yeah, for sure. And so 
then she'd like be like, well, I got to eat a salad today. And that's all she would eat. So she'd like drop down to, to four or 500 calorie days. So she was having these like monster swings. Oh my God, that's like half logic. Yeah, and that was like one of the first ones that I saw. And I was like, wow, that was, that just like blew my mind mm. that people would, would one, allow their kids to put that into their bodies. And two, you know, that, that they could function as human beings with that type of swing. So, so yeah, that was, that was one. And then the other was just complete opposite in that they were eating amazing food. Like they were eating all organic. They were eating like the local farm market stuff, but the mom was training for a marathon, which this one still is kind of blows my mind too, but she was training for a marathon and wanted to cut a little weight. So she was, she was keeping her intake at about 1500 calories. The like mom. That across mom was across yeah. the board so she was like well if i'm doing that then you know i'll just feed my kid the same amount and she was like doing 1500 calories for her 13 year old daughter she's just straight across the board and i mean as you know you know about 1800 calories is what a 13 year old girl needs just to survive not just for oxygen <laughs> organs so that's to sit on the couch all day and not do anything and like never turn her brain on like yeah. that's just uh you know 15 to 1800 calories like like that's about it. Now you add gymnastics on top of that where, you know, you could be up around 2,500, 3,000 calories and, and to, to see performance with really yeah, good food. For sure. But yeah. So she was struggling with a lot of overuse injuries. Gotcha. So those were kind of the two that really made an impression on me that, that, Hey, these parents need help just understanding what they're doing. And once the mom found like understood that she changed it and it was, they didn't need me anymore. Cause you know, once you get the nutrition right, a lot of these injuries just go away. Mm, yeah, and that's, it's actually really interesting. It's the, as things have become more, you know, as you and I know, as like, you know, we're pretty academic and with research and with especially some of these more clinical sciences that we work with, it's like, you answer one question and you don't get an answer, you get five more questions. You know, and I found the same thing is, as I worked more in gymnastics, especially as I started to work at the higher level around the world, I was like, wow, everybody has the same problem, but they're just common root issues. So that's how I got into, you know, nutrition is something that's so important to me that I don't want to, you know, dive into it too much. Cause I know you have to be like an expert at the physiology, the science to present that well to a kid. But I started to gravitate towards um, workload ratios. And I study now a lot of stress physiology and stress endocrinology. And it's amazing that the same things that I was like seeing as performance and recovery aspects for nutrition, sleep, hydration, you know, something called allostatic load, it was like all coming back to the basics, right? Sleep, water, nutrition, managing your time with periodization, and you know, being a good human who cares about kids and communicates with emotional intelligence, like those five things are like it that's like the, the base of the pyramid that you have and that we all understand and like people are like what's the best exercise i can do for my back to not hurt you know or like what's the best thing i can do for shoulder flexibility to get this more powerful tumbling or vault like this and i'm like dude if you don't figure out your culture and those five things first like you are in a very hot water and the only way i know that is because i royally screwed that up and it came back to bite me as a coach yep and i see that a lot too like when when because you post amazing exercises out there but I think what coaches have to do is they have to put it in perspective too. Mm. Like, hey, this is part of my plan. Like I planned out my entire year and right. this is part of my plan right now. And I get to share this with you. But I think a lot of, a lot of coaches are like, Hey, there's a shiny object and they miss out on that, on what you've talked about for the past year leading up to that exercise. Right. Right. And they don't want to do that work to put it in there. And I think, like you said, there's those small things that are going to give us big results and that's like the 80 20 principle mm -hmm. so if we can get 20 percent of just some of these basics right gymnastics is going to change yeah and this will lead perfectly into like kind of the first things we talk about in nutrition is like people see a snapshot of your program or a snapshot of how you treat somebody or in the nutrition thing they see a snapshot of like one meal before practice or after practice and they think that if i just eat this one thing i'll be fine you know if i just have like do like this one thing and tim gabbett when i was talking with him had an amazing like comment on this about workloads he was saying like you know workload ratios are one piece of the entire puzzle and how like the phrase an apple a day keeps the doctor away doesn't mean just have an apple and you won't get sick it means like generally if you eat well and you take care of yourself you'll be at an increased risk of healthier things it's the same thing with nutrition literally i guess but it's like you know if you have a bunch of good daily habits in in place that are based off of high quality evidence based off the demands of your sport and that are based on just the reality of working with kids you know that's going to increase your chance of 
pretty good performance and also reducing the injury risk. It's not that we're saying like you need to only eat organic farmer's market after practice in order to be successful. Right. Right. And I think that that's too, we look at, we look at developing a plan for parents, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get back to parents, but just because that's kind of who I, who I talk about with, you know, this information with, but parents are just kind of running out there and they're doing the same thing. Sometimes the coaches are, they're just like, Hey, let's throw this in there. Let's throw this in there. But mm -hmm. they're not planning out their week. So they have no clue what's going on with their athletes intake, you know, come Wednesday night when they're all exhausted and tired. Sure. Like, what am I going to put in this kid's body? And then they wind up at the fast food line. And then now we've got this big cascade of, of disaster. Mm. Once they yeah. put that kind of junk into their body. Yeah. So. It's, it's just like coaching, right? If you don't have a plan for your strength or for your skills or where the kids are going in five years, you know, you, once you get rubber meets the road and you have 30 minutes to do something in practice, or you have 30 minutes before practice to like get a kid to eat something. If you haven't already planned in advance, you're bound to fail from the beginning because you know, it's just too overwhelming. Yep. And I think too, coaches are doing a much better job now, like through your programs and, and a lot of the programs out there that, well, your programs, <laughs> we'll Thanks. stop there, but, uh, uh, they're, they're doing a better job of educating themselves and yep. that's really cool. But I think they need to also encourage their parents to educate themselves. Sure. And, and that's where, where they're just kind of like letting it go. Like this is the local soccer league, right? Where they're practicing two hours a week. Yeah, but right. It's not that kind of sport. It's an elite sport. And I've always said that. I think personally that even once you hit level four, you pretty much have an elite athlete hanging mm. out in your house. Mm. If you treat her like a, a like a rec soccer kind of league kid, you're going to wind up injured. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's something that, again, it becomes part of your your mindset shifts away from like, oh, I have to eat well to like, this is just part of what I do if I want to be successful if I want to be, mm -hmm. you know, make progress, not, a, and then success to me is not like, you know, winning a meet. It's more like constantly forward progress and being happy with your journey and feeling like you're making a, a positive dent in, you know, the way you treat kids. And I feel like it comes from, you know, if I want to do well, I have to go to the gym and work hard when I'm there. I have to take care of my academics so I can train. I have to get, get to bed at night. I have to make sure I fuel myself well. And that's always been something that I thought about is when I changed my mindset as a coach away from here's how I win to this is how I have the best chance of success these are the five to eight things I have to do every day. You know, it helped me a lot. Yeah. And building and, and on that same point is helping these kids be successful, not only at gym and school, but also school and yeah. then building habits that last a lifetime. Cause these kids are only going to be gymnasts till they're hopefully as we go here, we can extend gymnastics out to 25 or 26. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe even some professional sides of it. But right now, most gymnasts stop at 16 to 18. Yeah. So if we can, if we can encourage these great habits, then now we've got a kid that can make it for life eating the right foods at the right times. And then they're going to have a base of nutrition. They get done with gymnastics. There's not going to be a big weight gain. They're right. going to, because they, they understand, Hey, I'm eating for performance. Mm. You almost don't, don't even have to change your, your eating plan too much. Yep. It's just, you know, you're going to see, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this. I can eat this. I know that when I, when I have my pre-workout snack, I'm going to perform. Mm. Well, there, there's good ways for, for, for gymnasts that once they get out, if they build habits, they're not going to struggle like yeah. other kids did that didn't build the habits. Yeah. Right. It's the, it's the core concept of building good humans who happen to be great gymnasts as well, you know, or like, you know, good humans, good gymnasts second. And uh, I, I think, I mean, when I look at like why I'm still doing so much work in gymnastics, you know, why you spend 15 hours a day trying to help is it really comes down to wanting to have uh, you know, people who are happy with their experiences and are happy with the way things go, you know? And so when they, when they come down to, you know, the basics of, you know, I like building communities where kids can be happy and work super hard, learn the value of hard work, learn how to take care of themselves, have a community of friends that teach them values, have a positive role model. Like all those things are why we do it. And, and on the other side of it, you hope that when somebody gets out of their career, they understand how to work hard. Like I said, they know how to take care of themselves. They enjoy exercise. They enjoy a positive relationship with sports and with, whatever they want to go on to. Like, these are all the reasons that I think anybody listening to this podcast has taken an hour to do it is because this is what they truly care about. No, I don't know of many coaches out there who are like, I only coach gymnastics because I like to see first place trophies. And if you do, you need to have a serious conversation with yourself. But if like, you know, you're, you're in it for, I, I, somebody helped me love gymnastics and learn values. I'm trying to give that back. This is a conversation that has to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think when we, when we look at, look at organizations that have made goals,
gold medals their priority, right? right? USA Gymnastics, you look at the disaster that has become. Mm. So, and that's, that's what happens when you just focus on medals. It might look good and shiny for a little bit, but it's going to come crashing down. And that's what happened. Yeah. And this comes down to, you know, doing the right thing is always the right thing. You know, that's kind of what it came down to for me, especially is, uh, you know, there's many, many examples of successful people around the world. Nick Ruddick, um, friends of mine that have worked at the elite level that I've, I've been lucky to consult with that have the best of both. You know, they're, they're able to successfully build good kids and good athletes who can also achieve success because they're willing to have the harder conversation when it's the right thing to do. You know, right. and I think that nutrition is one of those things that comes down to it is like, you say the word like food or calories or nutrition and everyone kind of like looks around and like their hair stands up and they're like, Oh God, like I, we can't talk about weight. We can't talk about this. And it's like, understandably, like it's, it's one of the hardest, most delicate conversation that I had when I talked with Jamie about this, she has two young daughters who are going through this right now. And I know you have a daughter as well, who's in gymnastics along with a whole family. And it's like, you know, if you don't, if you don't take the time to read the research and understand what you're talking about, then like you have no business talking about any of this stuff with kids because one bad sentence or one offhanded comment that you don't think is going to affect a kid can, can send a, a 14 year old teenager down a complete spiral, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I really work with with families is, and dads in particular, but moms are, are guilty of this too. But what do we say to our kids as far as nutrition and what do we say to them about, their body types and how they look. And right. I think we just have such a, a mixed up way of, of thinking in the United States, especially on how body type should be, especially for an athlete. Mm. So and I think that when you put yourself in that box, that you're going to see a lot of, you're going to see a lot of problems like you just talked about, and you're going to send your kid into the spiral. Yeah. So instead of talking about always just talking about performance and talking about, Hey, this is how we do it to be healthy. Mm. And I mean, you know, breezy, she's, She's kind of gotten to the point where, where she's making these decisions on her own because it's yeah. all we've ever talked about. I never talked about the way Breezy looked except to say, hey, I think you're beautiful. Mm. But other than that, we don't talk about body size or shape because it's irrelevant to life. Mm. So I want her to be successful as a person. And, you know, it doesn't matter what shape she is. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think as, as people would probably listen to Jamie's too, as we talked a lot about that too, is how it's, you know, it's being able to not dodge the bullet on talking about the topic, but also having a, almost like a Rolodex in your mind of like things you should focus on talking about or when it, cause it comes up organically in, in practice. That's what, that's what always happens with me is, I mean, I still coach 10, 13 to 14 year old girls. And sometimes conversations about nutrition and food and energy come up, like just, they start talking about it in practice. And as a coach, you stand there and you go, all right, I'm self-aware to realize this conversation is going down a path of not bad, but it just, it's on nutrition. This is a sensitive topic I need to be self-aware self -aware of. And you, and you have to understand what to say and how to steer the conversation to a positive performance-based aspect. And especially for a lot of things that I see as leading by example, you know, like if you're, if you're not healthy as a coach and you're not a positive role model and you eat like crap and you're always tired and you don't sleep, but then you expect your, your athletes to follow what you say and not what you do. Well, that speaks volumes to what you're doing. So like you should probably have healthier options when you're in the gym coaching you should probably be, you know, on top of your own health and wellness. If you expect the athletes to do that. Absolutely. And that's probably yeah. huge for parents as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and the, the cool thing is, is when parents kind of follow along the same plan, they, they see enormous health benefits too. Sure, we yeah. even had back when we were doing it, as a, as a program, like we'd sell weekly plans. We had this whole, like whole floor of nurses that, and I have no clue how they found out about the plan, but they were all following it and all the recipes and, and all that. And, and like one time I got an email, just out of the blue, they're like, Hey, we're doing this contest. And, and all of us have lost like 30 pounds. Oh, <laughs> just the plan. And all it was, was they just had a plan. So yeah. they were eating for performance and, and following the plan. It wasn't anything special. It was just that they, they had a plan and they stuck with it and then they started exercising. So it's just kind of the other thing is for parents, just getting that mind right yeah, about, exactly. about what to eat and, and why you're eating food mm. and, and look at it that way. I'm um, going back to the coaches and talking about that at practice. One of the first thing I always do when I go into the gym is I always ask, I always ask kids, Hey, what'd your, what'd you guys eat today? What do you, what'd you have for your pre-workout snack? And a lot of times they'll be like, uh, I didn't have breakfast or I didn't have <laughs> yeah. a pre-workout snack. And I'm just like, how long do you think you're going to make it through practice? Like, is this going to be one of your best practices? Mm. So, so I just always try to kind of put the, the, what they take into their body to their output. So yeah. I'm not 
I don't get with them. Hey, you only had, you know, 150 calorie snack. Well, you know, I don't get in that. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what'd you say your kilogram body weight was again? Like, like they don't care. And neither do parents. Like some of that stuff, you've got to have that in the back of your mind, but you can't be, you know, it, it's not going to do any good if you talk like that to a kid. They're just going to, it's just going to go right over their heads and, and they don't care. They just yeah. want to eat to to have a great time at gym. Yep. Yeah. And that comes down to the, the best delivery method is typically, as you and I know from a medical point of view, is not talking about you're going to prevent injuries. You can do that because nobody really buys into that. You talk about like, Hey, you'll run faster. Hey, you'll, you'll, yeah. you'll get new skills. You'll perform better at meets, whatever it is. And then right. those ears perk up. Mm -hmm. that. So, um, yeah, so this is all like really cool stuff for like the meta level. What I think would be cool to talk about is maybe touch on briefly on a little bit of science for those people who, you know, are interested in that and want to know that some of the stuff we're going to talk about in these questions is like really validated. But then after that, I'd like to just do like some ground level tactics for, the listeners who are coaches, medical providers, parents that are going to find this. So are you cool with that? Yeah, very much. Yeah. So the first thing is, I mean, understanding, I guess, because in Jamie's episode, we talked a lot about how like the myth around young women in society, especially from her perspective, working as a nutritionist is like healthy carbs and healthy fats. Don't no fats, you know, no long act, no, no carbs at all. Like you should be a protein monster and all will go well in the world. Can you explain some of like, I guess the physiology or why, like it's so essential that young gymnasts and young females, especially are getting some sort of healthy carb and healthier fat for their, I guess their daily intake and kind of what those would look like as food examples. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple different things that, that most people don't know is one, they think that they need one of the biggest questions I get is how much protein does my gymnast need? Yep. Right. Where, where protein, if you look at it is for a kid and this is where in the science, it gets a little bit sketchy yep. when we talk about uh when we talk about food for for kids and especially young athletes yep. because all the studies have been done on adults because yeah. no one wants to take the risk to put a kid under a undernourished state and then make them do gymnastics right that's insane you're gonna they get injured and, and you're done as a provider so mm -hmm. so what you want so some of these are are guidelines and okay. so like for for a gymnast it, it's going to be or for a, a child, it's going to be 0.8 to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Right. It's a recommended amount. So, but if you look at adults, they're somewhere between you know 1.2 and 2 1.8, and there's different recommendations out there. But right. but for a kid, you know, the, their top level is going to be about 1.2, and that's going to fall within the the amount of protein for an adult athlete as well mm -hmm. per kilograms of body weight. So if we take that top one. You know, uh, something like a 80 pound girl, you're looking at somewhere around 44 grams of protein, gotcha. which winds up being a four ounce chicken breast and a cup of yogurt mm. is all the protein that they need for the day, yep. which is one meal. Yeah, it's, not it's not a ton of protein that a kid needs. And so because we use protein, especially for gymnastics as a repair mechanism, we're not using protein as a fuel. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that I like to explain to parents is that, is that uh, we can really focus on quality of protein rather than, than talking about quantity. So they don't need to be taking whey protein and, and, and substitutes for their protein. They, can, they could probably get all the protein they needed from plant-based with no problem. Yeah. Even sticking with beans and, and dark green leafy vegetables would probably get them there if they want to go that route. So they don't have to eat a steak every night. And even like the, the four ounce chicken breast, right? That's, that's very minimal. I mean, that's probably one of our bites. <laughs> yeah. right? So, so that's something to think about is one, they don't need as much protein as society tells us they need. Gotcha. And so we got to be careful with that. And, and if they take in too much, it's just a lot of load on their kidneys. So yeah. 10 to 10 to 25% is a recommended percentage for, for a young athlete to take in protein. I think keeping it lower is fine. You look at carbohydrates, you're looking at 55 to 65% of their intake come from carbohydrates. Mm. And the reason why is because that's what kids fuel themselves on. Yeah. So, uh, they're also more predisposed genetically to want to take in sweets. Gotcha. And that's why we always, we see kids eating candy in the gym. We see them eating junk because kids, they want to take in carbohydrates. Mm. That's one of their because that's their source of fuel. Especially, in, sorry to interrupt, but especially in gymnastics, which is very anaerobic, glycolytic in nature. Absolutely. So they're going to have an even higher disposition to want to take in 
and more carbohydrates. Sure. So because of that, exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful with that in that we want to encourage them to eat those great carbs. And then when they're having desserts, have fun, but just stay away from some of that processed stuff. Mm. I think that, and this is a theory that I've been playing with a little bit. I haven't found anything in the literature to kind of back this up, but when a kid has, has candy during practice, like why is that so bad for them? Mm. And as we know in fruit, there's a lot of other stuff in there that, that keeps it like fiber mm. that, that kind of mitigates that release of sugar into the, into the bloodstream. And if you have soluble fiber, like in an apple, it yeah. also has the ability to, to uh, regulate insulin okay. in the bloodstream as well. Yeah. So, so I think what happens when you take in those simple sugars during practice, like candy or they're drinking soda uh, during their break time, I think that you have insulin that's coursing through the blood that's not controlled. Gotcha. And so I think you get a lot of, and this is where, where I haven't found the science, but just kind of thinking through some of the mechanisms, yeah. I think that you will get a lot of the, the insulin binding to, to fat type cells and, and uploading some of that sugar as stored as fat. Gotcha. So I think that that can be some of the danger of, and then you lose the, you lose some of the blood sugar in the, in the blood, the sugar in the blood, the glucose. Yep. And now you have, that's where you see the crash. Yeah. It's, and that's, that's kind of where it comes down to, right? Is for people that are maybe, this is getting a little heavy is that you have, you know, the stored glucogen in your muscles and stuff like that. And glu like the free, uh, free forms that you're ready to use from what you've eaten up to practice. Right. So the night before right. the morning, and again, this is all stuff that I've learned from Josh. So I want to put credit where it's due, but understanding that you have all of this buildup of your main source of fuel from carbs and health things like brown rice and beans, things like that, you know, Absolutely. longer acting carbs, those become stored in your muscle, but they only give you so much fuel before you burn through it. And you need to replace those things, which is why you have taught me and that our gym we do is like, you know, between second and third event, pop some grapes in your mouth. Like yeah. you want food because you have to then ingest another dose of some form of glucose to survive the last two hours of practice because what's stored in the muscle is then, kind of burned up and you need new fuel because at the end of practice, people typically do a lot of physical preparation and heavier stuff. So what we're talking about is a way to maintain the input output bucket, right? You know, like, okay. like I said, anaerobic glycolysis is very carb heavy along with some other stuff you need for recovery. So we're, we're trying to talk about the, the cellular mechanisms of why that's happening. Yeah. 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 Great. And, and getting that. So what I talk about is the roadmap to success. And we'll get back there to the individuals in a second, but the, the roadmap to success. So we have breakfast, mid morning snack, lunch, pre-workout yeah. snack, during workout snack and dinner. Yeah. And for a kid, you know, we can make arguments about different types of, of diets mm -hmm. and fasting and things like that. But there, I haven't seen any research out there that promotes anything other than eating frequently for children. Yeah. So if we, we got to be careful when we start messing around with that because there just isn't any research to back it up that I've seen. Gotcha. So if we, if we start off and we start the day with a great breakfast and just like you said, because we fasted for eight to 10 hours for a, for under 12 year old or over 12 year old and 10 to 12 hours for a, for under 12 year old. So that's really important to get that food back in their system right. and get them, um, get those repairing the cells and start building up the glycogen for gotcha. the next day, which yeah. I get, or which starts the night before with dinner, but then you keep it going throughout the day. And, and you also have to remember when they go to school, they're going to be burning up a ton of glucose. Yeah. Right. The brain is the main user of glucose. Mm. So if we, if we're not building those, those good stores and giving them really good, healthy carbohydrates, which like we said, is 55 to 65% of their diet, then, then we're going to be putting them at danger for, for not succeeding in school. And we don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and so then I've always said that that, that pre-workout snack is then going to be probably the second most important meal because it's yep. the last chance, like you yep. said, to get carbohydrates in their system yep. and then for them to push it into their cells so that they're able to succeed. Once how long back. does that window take between like when you ingest a pre-workout to like when it actually maybe is available for use? That's a good question. It depends on the sugar form gotcha. Gotcha. And, and also how much you know, how much fiber is included in that. Yeah. So there's some cool stuff that just the more fiber that you kind of put in there, sometimes it'll even push it past where, where the pancreas will have more effect on it. The insulin will have more effect on it, like further down in the intestines and you'll get it absorbed. 
yeah. you'll get a better kind of release of it. So just that's why you don't want to have it five minutes before practice. Sure. Yeah. Cause it won't show up till your first event is done. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then you're going to have the slowing down of the, of the motility of the intestines anyways, at that point. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be careful of that. But with that being said, right, you want to make sure that if they're going to, if they don't have another opportunity, I'd rather them still have a pre-workout snack five minutes before than not. Right. Yeah. And we so, get that too. We have girls that run in super late to practice and they like, I'm like, are you good? Like you're feeling right. They're like, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of starving. I'm like, dude, take 20 minutes, go get yeah. food like join the first event halfway through like I better it's better that you like digest and don't like throw up but like put chug in a bunch of water than yeah you know, like. but just imagine that Dave and that's such a cool I, I don't even know if coaches picked up what you did there but you just had the opportunity to give this kid some food you you're helping her build a habit but now you're also decreasing the chance that she's going to get injured that day so you right. took 20 minutes for the chance of decreasing six months out of gym yeah I mean to me, that's an, uh, an investment and no gymnast is going to be a bad gymnast because she missed 20 minutes of practice. Yeah, exactly. Like, I just don't, I mean, you can't, there's nothing in science that says that if you miss 20 minutes out of, of 20 hours a week, that, that's going to be, you're going to be a, a horrible gymnast. Yeah, this is, I have a, a side story, which is very appropriate. And then I want to get one more like nerdy thing and then we'll move on. So Right. Um, an episode I listened to with uh, on Jim Kastik, so Pang Pang Lee, do you know who she is? Mm -hmm. so back in the day, five to six years ago, you and I were talking about, this is when you were like kind of forcing me down the road of like, maybe we should take a little bit more time off after changing yeah. stuff, right? So Pang Pang Lee hurt her back. She had a spondy fracture when she was 14. She took a complete year off of gymnastics. No gymnastics, no physical activity besides PT, absolutely nothing. And she ended up coming back after she grew and getting all her skills back just fine, competed in Elite Canada, and then she tore her ACL. And she had another like issue. So like she had like so many years of disuse and I'm not getting her timeline completely correct, but um, that's something that came up. It's a huge thing. And she got all her skills back and she got all of her, she had good coaches. She was super in tune. She changed her skill profile. They respected workloads. She, you know, there's so many successful things that had to go well, but the myth of like, not only can you take 20 minutes off, <laughs> but you could probably <laughs> afford a week here or there. You could probably apparently go for a year, you know, and get your skills back. But obviously, there's so many factors that go into it. And as a coach, as someone who's trying to help 10 girls get higher level, I'm not saying that, like, we need to all take a year off and, like, everyone's going to be fine. Some kids need more consistency. Some kids need to be, you know, in the gym more because maybe they don't understand that, like, you can't take eight weeks off and expect mm -hmm. to make some progress. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure the pendulum doesn't swing on the other side about, yeah, like, yeah. if we don't do gymnastics, we'll still get really good at gymnastics. But at the same time, 20 minutes here and there, a, a mental recovery day when the athletes are in the middle of, like, heavy, heavy season and they're just, like, buried and they need, like, one night to do homework. Like, those things are not only going to build so much trust in the bank with your athlete, but they're also probably – giving you a signal that you're going to get back on the other side of recovery and things will be much more productive. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Getting back to that building skills, I think that's a good way to transition over to fats too. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and 25 to 35% of your, your diet should come from fats. Gotcha. And like I always say in our seminars, right? You're not going down to McDonald's and taking a cup and dipping yeah. it into the <laughs> grease and <laughs> so disgusting. <laughs> but after it cools, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> you can carve it up. Yeah. But that's a great way to kind of look at a lot of people are getting their, their fat from that source. And it's no different than than dipping the cup in the in the grease and drinking. So that's not the fat we want, right? We want those those avocados and fish and good oils and nuts and seeds, yep. those green leafy vegetables, yep. broccolis, all those contain amazing fats in them. And that's what we want to take in. And most people don't understand the quantity of fat that we need mm. for gymnasts at, you know, and 25% is on the low end. Yep. So, uh, and, and why do you want fats? Well, most people don't even know that somewhere around 70 to 85% of the brain is made up of fat. Mm. And that's what kind of cements so when you teach them a skill, that fat helps to cement the process and it makes the process quicker yep. and it makes them uh, permanent. And that's why that young lady was able to, to do gymnastics further on down the road, even though she had taken a year off. Because mm. if they're eating right and you're teaching them right, they're going to be able to do these skills when they're 90 years old. Mm. So there, there's, that's one of the reasons. The other one is, is fats in every cell of the body. So. Mm. It's one of the things that protects us. It protects our organs. It, it keeps us warm. So we gotta, we can't, 
we can't discount the importance of it but we also don't want to eat the trans fatty acids and things mm. like that the junk food so we right. want to that's in the and, and i've got three categories of food that i always talk with and i've kind of i gave it a name this week okay. <laughs> just after i wrote it on the board yeah. so i called it my ebid my <laughs> ebid foods so when it's eat before you die right oh, so nice. that's my lowest category of food so that's those donuts and fast food and junk right yeah. if if i was walking around and I hadn't eaten in 35 days and I was ready to die. I'm going to have a Big Mac because yeah. that's going to, that's going to keep me from, from dying. Mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and then after that, I have my good foods, right? That's my next category up. And that's like my meats, like, like steaks, milk products. Um, some of the processed foods I have a, I have a fig bar that I like to eat and I have it for my mid morning snack and I like it. And that's a good food. It's not one that I want to eat for every meal of the day. Mm. Maybe, you know, I'm keeping that 10 to 20% of my diet. And then I have my optimal foods. Yep. And those are, our, are the whole foods that we love to put in our bodies. And that's where we want to get our fats from, especially. So yeah. carbohydrates too. And so, like I said, all those examples of good fats. And, and whenever you look at those whole foods, most of them contain the protein, carbs, and fats. Mm. In very, very good proportion. Gotcha. So when we're eating a really good, healthy dinner of um sarah made this meal the other day that just about blew my mind uh your, your wife yeah my <laughs> wife so she made um she made quinoa tacos oh my lord you speak uh, of heart. and and i thought when i first took the first bite i was like oh they're chicken tacos because we do that too and yep. we're, we love tacos and making fresh salsa and stuff like that so so yeah it was quinoa and i took a bite and it was and it was just amazing mm. <laughs> So it tasted just like chicken at first. And I was like, oh man, that's perfectly seasoned and yeah, yeah. taco. But that's the kind of stuff that, that you can do with food and you can make it fun, but you can also, uh, that taco probably had everything I needed in perfect proportion. Mm. So yeah. that's where, that's where those good foods get you. Yeah. Yeah. That's super helpful to kind of break down those three categories. And I'm going to kind of wrap this all up into like a, a global kind of coaching context. And then we'll mm -hmm. talk about maybe some examples for all those things. So sure. For, this is for the, the very nerdy people. So if you're not in our category, just black out for like five minutes. But the reason, this, this is what I study. And this is what we haven't talked about since we've connected is I study a ton of stress neuroendocrinology and why the balance of work to recovery is so important, right? So obviously for injuries, if you load something more than it can take, it's going to break down. That's like a, the physiology of, of human tissues. But at the same time, and this is what I've learned from Dr. Sands and some other people and some really cool researchers, uh, Bruce McEwen has really good research, Robert Sapolsky. Um, and combining it with Tim Gabbett's work is like when you look at stress, it's it's a constant tug of war between stressing your body optimally and recovering enough to super compensate, right? So that's kind of like what that's everything we do in life is doing that. Like the the physical stressor of a conditioning circuit, the mental stressor of being in front of a big crowd and having a big meet to compete with, um, the emotional stressor of maybe somebody says something nasty to you on Instagram. This is what I deal with with teenagers, and you don't like that because it's like socially you know, overwhelming, those things all generally based on context recruit a very similar stress response, right? Cortisol, you know, uh, cortical releasing hormone floods your body with cortisol from the adrenal glands and you recruit a stress response, right? And it's good when used in a short dosage, it's built for acute stressors. That's how we survive. That's, that's very good for us. But when you run hot for too long or when you keep spiking these little things higher, 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 you become what's called excitotoxic. So now glucocorticoids, right. they have harmful wear and tear effects on your body. So your hippocampus, your amygdala, your prefrontal cortex, they start to deteriorate slightly because those, those things aren't made in chronic dosages. They're made for these short-term responses. So the reason I'm saying this in the context of nutrition is when you go through an acute stressor of practice or a school, like we're saying with the brain, or you get in a huge blowout fight with your friend and you're really having a rough day, it's all pulling from the same bank. It's pulling from the same bank account and fuel of nutrition, sleep, hydration, and having time away from the aggravating stressor is what recovers the system the other side to super compensate. So if you have the optimal dose of stress, you plan practice well, you understand how human physiology works, you, you don't push the athlete too hard in one acute mental stressor and say like, you know, do a pressure set in front of the whole gym because that might overwhelm them. If you do that optimally dosed well, and then you have the recovery side of it to pair with it, well, that's called allostasis. That's your body's attempt to constantly recover from an acute stressor to super compensate. And all of these things are now being shown to change at a genetic level. So our epigenetic changes will happen when we 
exposed to new stressors, our brain starts to recalibrate to express more genes of stress responses, or like you're saying with food, using these things to change kind of how our body's physiology works. And so that's why we're talking about it from an academic point of view is because this is how kids grow, adapt, learn, become amazing humans, because the physiology of stress is everything that we do, whether that's you know, stress from school or stress from gymnastics, it is what happens when people low and grow. So we're trying to create an environment socially that kids can work hard and push themselves and be challenged. But we're also trying to put equal as much time into the recovery side with nutrition and understanding why do I need to eat healthy carbs and when well-rounded fats to promote the allostasis of recovery, right? So yep. that's and what my world has been in the last two years. Absolutely. And you look at, you look at this from a parent's point of view, you look at what you're talking about, about DNA repair and then epigenetics yep. and things of that nature. You look at, you look at just this crazy thought of what I'm feeding my kids now isn't just what they're eating and what they're, they're producing and their outcome. What you're feeding your kids now is feeding your grandkids mm. and your great grandkids. Yeah. So that'll blow your mind right there. If you just think about <laughs> when you're getting, when, when I take my kid to McDonald's and I'm putting that in their body, I'm making my grandkids and my great grandkids, I'm putting them under stress mm. right now because their DNA is changing, especially like you said, if you've had a stressful day and then you put that junk in their bodies, yeah. they're going to start expressing their genes differently than, than say someone that went home and had something that was a, a inflammation reducer type diet. Mm. So they stayed away from those, those red meats and the, and the greasy foods mm. right, that, that you would get at fast food because you start to, you have the epigenetics part of it where you're expressing those genes in right. a certain way. Not changing them. That's what epigenetic is for those people that are right. white. Your genome is there, but you adjust what's expressed based on your experiences. Right. But if you don't have the right food as well, yeah. you're not going to repair those cells the right way. Mm -hmm. And so over time you can have an actual change in the DNA. Right. And that's where it gets, gets crazy scary. For a parent, at least for me, I don't yeah. want to think about my grandkids who just thinking about that right now when my daughter's 11 is hard to <laughs> think anyways, but to, but to think about, about, you know, what's going to happen to them if we don't feed them properly is, and all the diseases, I think a lot of the diseases we're seeing right now is a result of that, of the junk that we've stuck in our kids because it was convenient or, you know, I didn't have time to do something right. Mm. And, and that's the tough stuff parents don't want to hear, but we got to start sucking it up as parents and doing the right stuff. Yeah, it's, it's hard. But when you look at the, the overlapping graphs of the data for um, stress physiology of what those hormones do and workloads, there's a U curve, right? There's a U curve mm -hmm. where a little bit of acute stress is beneficial and it helps you, but then it's, it hits a sweet spot and then it starts to tank where too much too often or not the right things in your body to support recovery starts to trash you with wear and tear. So that's the aspect that it comes down to is like, because of the ramifications of the, the bad side of the curve, you have to take these things super, super seriously. And I think that's kind of why this conversation is so important because it really dictates, you know, their brain formation, their ability to learn gymnastic skills, retain gymnastic skills, and also survive an upward trend over a 20 year career, hopefully, and not kind of get to that puberty or sticky spot and then have not good recovery, not good fuel. And then the stress becomes higher and they start to trend down and they kind of get into that, that toxic side. Mm -hmm. So, all right. If you're that's good stuff. I like that. Yeah, back away from the nerds. It's, well, we always have these conversations like on the phone and we're like, we should record this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's go back into like the very basic kind of ground level sure. stuff for all this. So out of those three categories, can you give a few examples of, of optimal and not as optimal fat, protein, carbs for people? Absolutely. So carbs, and we'll start with optimal for carbs. So you're looking at, at anything plant-based, right? So you're looking at those fruits and vegetables. Beans have great carbohydrates in them. Yeah. And, and prepared, and, and we could also get into that, something like a Dave's Killer Bread or Ezekiel Bread. Yeah. I think it's pretty, maybe that's in between good and optimal, but. Back to the seminar when you always brought up Dave's Killer Bread and you told the story about it. <laughs> that's still my favorite, that's still my favorite bread. And, and I still, like, even, Anyways, we'll get away from that. It's but, in my fridge yeah. right now, but yeah, the 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 things that have whole whole grains like that that are quality made, sourced from great products. That's what we want to kind of be putting in in our kids. Staying yeah. away from from those simple sugars that you find in the middle of a grocery store. That's mm -hmm. where you want to kind of stay away from with carbohydrates. So yep. 
So, and, and thinking that through as far as like, like a, a mid morning snack, maybe you're doing something like apples dipped in and peanut butter or almond butter, yep. or if there's allergies, they could do, do, um, sunflower butter. Yeah. Like some butter. Yep. Yep. Something like that. So, which is just made from sunflower seeds. So that would be a great mid morning snack pre-workout snack. Like I'm going to go back to my favorite, which is half a peanut butter sandwich on Dave's killer bread, Mm -hmm. like, or Zico bread or something like that. Cause it's easily portable for your kid. Mm -hmm. Most make like a little, little sandwich boat and they can take it and, and they can consume it easily. They can stick it in their lunch if they don't have time to, to go home after practice. Yeah. Uh, so that would be something that that would be heavy on the carbs. Yep which is where we want 65%, but it also has those fats and proteins in it as well. So, so that would be carbohydrates. So good is maybe, like I said, like that fig bar, right? It's still organic and really good grains, but it's a little bit processed. So that would be kind of good. And, and sometimes, right, we, we're going to go with good based on time, but yep. we want to, that's a smaller percent. You want to make those whole foods yep. as best as possible. So, and then protein is going to be, our goods going to be meats, chicken, beef, pork, um, sometimes pork, depending on where it's sourced yep. and milk products, right? Exactly. Those are going to be the goods. Yep. And then your excellence are going to be the salmons and the seeds and the beans and exactly. those whole food products. So, and I'm a big whole foods person. Totally. So if you're going to be eating, the food, think, not the store. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, the, I want them, I want to see your kids eating real food. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. And like you said, you did grapes. That was a great idea. Because you don't really do a designated uh, time for snack, but you just have them as they're over there, they're able to pop it in their body. Yep. And another gym in New York City, I know they, that because New York City is a lot different than a lot of the, like the country places where I am, they bring in those carbohydrates mm. and, and they have them there in the, in the, for their snack, but um, in like a fruit tray. Yep. So, but, but proteins, you know, you're looking at those, the good quality Ones are the fish too. If you're going to be looking at, at um, ideally wild caught, right? Correct, wild caught, cold water mm. type fish. There are some mackerel and stuff like that, and there are some good stuff out of the Gulf of Mexico too that you could you could get. Staying away from those farm raised stuff is yeah. what you're, especially the ones coming out of China and and the other countries. Yeah, for so sure. That, that don't necessarily look at their their food the way we do. Mm. So and then fats. Fats. So again, you know, you can get into those, those salmon and, and that would be kind of the, the cold water fish would be the best meat type product to get where you're getting the protein and the fats, but you're looking at avocados, seeds, Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, some of the oils, Uh, gotta be careful with some of the like vegetable oils or the cheaper oils, but you want to look at flaxseed oil, grapeseed oil, things like that, that are, that are more um, natural and, and sourced with good, good products. So does that kind of get there? Yeah, no, that's perfect. And there's a couple of follow-ups that I think I know my brain goes to and that other people have. So one is what do you do with people who either have uh, food choice preferences? So like vegetarian or vegan or allergies, Mm -hmm. gluten or um, nut butters, things like that. Yeah, for sure. So there's some good, like we talked about for, for nut butters, you can do, if you still like the taste of it, some kids don't even like the, the feeling of the, the butter. So then you got to go with something different, yep. but there's alternatives to that, like sun butter where they use sunflower seeds the, and they make a paste out of that, yep. which, is, which is a good alternative. And a lot of kids like that. Yep. So as far as that, as far as milk allergies or, or gluten allergies. So with milk allergies, I think you could have a, a total diet without having any milk products at all and be yep. completely healthy. Yep. So that one worries me less and gluten's tougher just because there's a lot of, we eat a lot of processed food. Yep. But I think if you, if you look at some of the, if you stick more whole food, I think you can go without gluten anyways. Gotcha. Maybe being careful with the, with the carbohydrates are harder to get yep. somewhat. But I think if you stick with some of those, those beans and those, yeah, those nut right. butters. Yep. Now, once you start stacking up your different issues, so if you're gluten and your nut allergy, yes. you have all those things, it gets much harder. And yes. that's where I think it's really important to work with a nutritionist or a dietitian that, sure. that designs a program for you yep. to, to really maximize what you're, what you're looking at. Yep. So I think, but most 95% of gymnasts don't necessarily fall in that category. Yep. It's more, they have preferences, sure. right? <laughs> They're like, well, I'm going to eat my, I'm going to eat my, my nuggets and yeah. my and my french fries and that's all i'm gonna eat and you can't make me eat anything else yeah so and that's so and parents are like well okay 
uh, Jenny, uh, you eat whatever you want. And, but they just don't understand the importance of it and kind of what we've talked about. They just see their kid going and, and playing rec soccer at the gymnastics gym. Like they don't think of it as their body's under load mm. and intense load. So, yes. and that's part of what we have to do is encourage them to learn more about what's going on yep. and understand the gravity of what's happening to their child, mm. and how cool gymnastics is, but also how demanding it is. Yep. And if we can help them understand that and help the kid understand that and teach them and help them try new things because we can all adapt to new food. Yeah, absolutely. And then what about vegan preferences? Vegan, I, I, I think, again, you're, you're looking at a plant-based diet. Yep. So as long as you're staying away from uh, you got to be careful with the soy, like getting a lot of, of your nutrients from that. Mm -hmm. But if you can stay away from that and stay just with the, like I said, like those bean based yep. proteins, yep. I think, and, and a lot of great protein comes from, from our green leafy vegetables and, and other type of vegetables. I don't think we need to be, I don't think we need to eat meats to be successful. Yep. So, yep. Um, yeah. And I, for people that are listening, so I have on our team, one of each of those examples we have two athletes that are fully vegan and we have one mm -hmm. who has a nut allergy and then we have one who does have a, a dairy sensitivity so mm -hmm. we've had these conversations about all of them um in terms of it usually comes up as a conversation and i drop a very small amount of information about like oh there's a way to do it you know you can certainly do it but i, I think we should talk to your mom and make sure you understand what food you like how to pack them make sure that they're not going to like you know spoil if you keep them in a lunchbox all day long or there's been times when we'll keep they'll buy bulk food of what's yes. safe for them and we'll just keep it in the office. So we'll do something like that. So um, I've had two athletes who are very successful, completely vegan, and then one who is very, very nut sensitive and one who's very, very dairy sensitive. So it's just about communication. You know, it's, right. it's about framing the conversation into performance based. And, you know, this is just like, you know, your preference or your choice and that's totally fine. What's not okay is that you don't talk about it and let us know. And then you just crash in the middle of practice or you're hangry or something's right. going wrong. So let's, Let's just address the, the situation and deal with it. And like I said, have something here for you or, you know, find a way for your parents to, to have something. And I really think those young athletes that are going, especially milk allergies and, and, and vegans that don't understand the principle of, of the percentages that they need. Yeah. I think we've got to be careful with, with those athletes, like you said, but also some of the things that we can look for is in a blood test, we can look for some of the, the vitamin D deficiencies. Sure. You know, I, I think that's a, Say again. Iron too is a, is a iron too. Yeah. You just want to make sure for those athletes that maybe you're checking that once a year, but I think all, all our gymnasts that once they're getting into to over level seven should probably be doing a blood test once a, at least once a year, yep. like definitely during, during this time of the year, as we get closer towards the end, just yep. to see what they're deficient in. Yep. And that's not too traumatic to have your blood drawn. Yeah. So yeah. especially as an athlete, I think that's important so that they could do a whole like panel on where they're looking at with their nutrition and what they're deficient in. Cause you don't want to have a, a athlete that's low on calcium or, mm -hmm. or low on vitamin D and you're looking at that in the bones and all of a sudden you start getting these, these stress fractures yep. because you haven't seen the sun for, for, you know, 10 months yep. and you're part of the country. So, yep. so it's, it's, that's where we get, we don't get outside and then we don't get the nutrients mm -hmm. and then that creates a perfect storm for gym nice. sometimes too. Yeah, very cool. And so I guess the last thing is this will shift the conversation towards parents. But um, so having all those things wrapped up into like kind of more the athlete education side, I think that's really what all this comes down to is communication and athlete education, right? Like if you're the person who knows it, you should do it. If you're not the person who doesn't feel comfortable with it or understand, you should find somebody else. But the more you can educate the athlete on why it's why it's important, how it's for performance and those things, the better. And I think that's that's really across all of gymnastics of what we're seeing is the biggest change is empowering the athlete to be educated and be a part of the decision making, which is huge for their own, you know, decision to eat well or to fuel themselves. But on the other side of it is let's end the conversation. Maybe we're talking about how this shifts to parents and how this shifts to home life. Cause I know that's a, something I've experienced with uh, the challenge of working with honestly, all youth kids. It's not just gymnastics or young female athletes, but uh, there's many well-intentioned coaches who talk the right thing. They know how to do it, but it just, the dots just aren't even close to connecting when it comes down to home life. And they're like, yeah, well, before gym and maybe like right after they eat really, really well, but like I can't control the other 18 hours that someone happens. So how do you discuss the conversation about parents and, you know, home life and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. The parents are, they're very interesting because they're bringing all of their preconceived notions 
to the table about nutrition. Right. So sometimes it's very difficult to have these conversations until something happens. Yeah, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, and, and they don't see that this is a slow decline like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Some of these athletes are, are coming down the wrong side of the curve, and mm -hmm. we don't want them necessarily there and overuse injuries and, and even back fractures. But yep. some of this could be mitigated if they start thinking about nutrition first. Yep. So part of that is just human nature, and I don't know if we can control that yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Right? But as they start, to, as a parent becomes curious about it, I think we need to – have resources that are available for parents. And that's what, that's kind of what gymnast care was based on yep. is how do we educate parents on this? Cause my personal opinion is that 95% of gymnastics happens at home. Yes. Yeah, so I'd agree with that. Well, a lot of people are, and, and, and that's not to, to be down on coaches because what you do in the gym is kind of like, you're, you're kind of icing the cake, right? You're making, you're yeah. making things, amazing and you're fine-tuning what they're doing at home yeah so, so we have to get parents understanding especially as they get into team level gymnastics that your home life is going to drive what's happening at gym yep. Yep. and so if they can understand that and that's partly my job at gymnast care is to figure out ways to better reach parents sure and and be able to help them understand what's going on and and but from a coach's side i think that we need to encourage parents to look at more education too right. like hey what if what if as part of your because i know coaches always have team meetings yep. but maybe it's even something like hey what are you guys doing at home to educate yourself on on nutrition for gymnastics yep. maybe that's a part of their of your yearly requirements hey we're going to get into the nutrition master class with gymnast care or or you know jamie right if she has something yep. that that she has there for them that really helps educate you know, yep. there's, there's tons of gymnastics parents out there. There's plenty of us to help out. Yep. And some are going to relate to her and some will relate to me. Yep. And we'll, we'll all be able to just work together to help these parents become, become amazing at home, giving their, their kids the right food. Yes. So I think partly it just comes down to education. Yeah, that's super helpful. And this is what Jamie brought up in her conversation was that she, she felt really bad for parents because you're at the, you're at the mercy of the, the social media age, right. in the, in the buzzworthy news age. And so, you know, the analogy that we use a lot on the show is like, it's like trying to drink from a firing hose, right. You're trying to like process information. And, and there's, I would say, like, I think 90% of parents are well-intentioned. They want to do well coaches as well. And they just have poor in, information sources, right. It's so hard. It's so noisy. Nutrition is the noisy area of, of gymnastics in my opinion. And I think that um, that's why it's so important to, it all comes back to education and communication, but um, I think there's a few good strategies you can do. So one is, uh, again, humbly admitting you're not the person who wants to deliver the information, but having resources. And so the people that don't know that, like we have your plan, like slapped against our board in our, in our gym and the kids just see it every once in a while, or we every once in a while, we'll send a newsletter home and be like, Hey, by the way, you know, a couple of good tips for nutrition or whatever it is, or we frame it in the context of recovery or like, how do you just not have an athlete who's really like cranky all the time? Mm -hmm. uh, but like just dropping that like subtle, one or two little nuggets here and there. So it's never this like overhauled conversation about weight or this overhauled conversation about nutrition. It's just part of your training culture. And I think um, Jamie had a really good suggestion in, in like the handbook or in like something like when you move up to level seven or whatever team you're on, you know, here's your packet. This is like the meat policy. This is when you should be at practice. This is some like recovery stuff that has nutrition in it. Here's some stuff for self-care at home. And like, oh, by the way, here's like your, your meat fee schedules as well. Like it's just part of your program you know what i mean but Absolutely. that requires you vetting the right sources of information and understanding that nobody probably wants to have the conversation that we had about genetic changes with food but you should find and trust the people who are going to teach that information and when you have a problem or a question you can ask them and they can give you an answer so you know like i know that your information and jamie information is legit so i'm okay using it right and i hope that people would do the same thing for other areas of gymnastics like if you have the experience that's the quality of academic information you want to use and it will change and it will morph with science, but at least you're at the forefront of what you need to be doing so that when you say the right thing, people are like, okay, it comes from a valid source and it's not this weird thing to talk about. It's part of our program. Absolutely. And that's kind of what, you know, and, and getting into what we developed was with the gym, uh, gymnastics masterclass uh, nutrition mm -hmm. right for gymnastics parents so yep. it's a master class for gymnastics parents and it was designed to help them just understand nutrition right. and what their kids need and understand 
we get into some of those protein, carbs, and fats. What are the best ones? Yep. What are the ways that they can optimally use them to protect their athletes? And, and that can just become part of those gymnastics coaches push. And then once they've, once they've developed that understanding, that basic understanding of nutrition, Mm. Then they can start looking. Hopefully, then that helps them dive even deeper. Yep. So that's the basics of the course, and it really helps athletes to become amazing and build habits that last a lifetime. Mm. And that in our master class, we also have each week we have videos just for the gymnasts gotcha. that are short and consumable. Perfect. So that way, because a kid's not going to sit there for an hour. I've done, oh. I've done, and you know it too. Like you've been to our nutrition seminars where like 20, 30 minutes, 25 minutes, like they're pumped, like they love it. But then you'll get those older girls that it's awesome. They'll start asking tons of questions and you've got like the eight year old in front that just like her eyes rolled up in her head and she's <laughs> on the floor sleeping. So they're only going to take so much information. Yeah. So if we can make it really consumable and give it to them, they're going to take that in and get excited. And each week for our gymnasts, I always give them an assignment. So for the first week, they're going to develop their own plan for a weekly eating. Gotcha. And they're going to hand it to mom and be like, Hey mom, this is what I want to do this week. Sure. And sure. it's going to blow parents mind because we, we just did a, a little seminar here with the, with the kids at the gym and the parents were like, there's no way my kid's going to eat this. I'm like, she wrote it down. They're yeah. going to eat it because it was her idea. Yeah. So now, that gonna... was one of my questions on picky eating that you actually answered yourself, right? Is, is involving them in the process. Absolutely. That's the biggest thing. And then getting them involved in the kitchen. That's the second thing is, and, and we see it like Sarah, Sarah just bought this knife set just for our kids, which is kind of scary, but, uh, they're getting in and they're starting to, each one's starting to make a meal each week, yep. which is fun. And it's, they're putting all sorts of stuff. And the neat thing is the picky, horrific meals that you had to smile through. You're like, this is great. <laughs> this is great, honey. But they, but Sarah's a magician. So even if it does turn out a little wild, she'll like throw a couple spices in there and it'll be a I like this, uh, shrimp chili, uh, you know, <laughs> rice mix. But there's, but there's ways to sneak in that nutrition. One thing Sarah did the other day that was just out of this world. Amazing was she took carrots and beets and kind of put them in the blender and, and blend them up. And she put it in the sauce with our lasagna. Oh, yeah. It's huge. And so, like, we had beets and carrots. And she put some other stuff in, too, that I don't even know. She, like, comes to me later, and she's like, guess what I put in there? Like, like <laughs> an evil scientist. But, but it was the only time that you could tell that there was beet juice in there was when it was, I, like, checked it real quick. And you could yeah. see a little bubbling up. But then once it was completely done, you had no clue that yeah. there were beets and carrots and all this amazing stuff in there. So, so that's what we want to help parents do is be able to get great nutrition into their, into their diet. And then those kids, they're going to think it's fun to sneak it in there on their, on their siblings. Yeah. And they're going to be like, Hey, <laughs> but you don't even know what you're eating. And they'll like rub it in afterwards. So that's amazing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, that's awesome, man. It's so much good stuff. And I guess yep. summarizing here so I can let you go on to your normal job and me as well. Um, <laughs> So like the biggest things here really are education, right? Yourself and for the people involved, it's communication. It's not, it's, it's having the conversation in the proper context and light. And then a lot of it's just planning, right? A lot of this stuff comes down to under like doing the work to know what's the optimal thing, what your kid wants as a coach, what you should be talking about, but then really taking time to, to put effort into planning it throughout the week or throughout the, you know, the few days so that you don't feel like you're getting buried and overwhelmed. Cause that's a common question that comes up is how do I, plan for the whole day how do I the schools and lunches and this and it's like well you got to know what they want to eat and you have to plan it right you have to either put it in a lunch you have to have it in the in the car as something that's not going to perish or spoil that they can eat on the way to gym um, it has to be something that if you have a long drive from gym there's something quick you can eat in the car on the way home like there's ways to do this and get these little habits built in so it doesn't feel like this you know tectonic wave that's going to come over you but um would you agree with all that absolutely 100 yep. percent. yeah that's a whole that's all we do yeah. So kind of going back on the, the resources side is, like I said, I, I use a lot of the stuff you've given me with the athletes and we hand them out. And what do you, where, do you, where can people find either more things to kind of start chewing on, no pun intended, um, or what can they do to kind of like start this process of like, I just want to read a quick thing about like, where do I start? Yeah, absolutely. So what we did was because, you know, for Shift Movement Sciences, what we did was we created a special page over at Gymnast Care. So if you go to gymnastcare.com forward slash shift, Okay. What we have there for you is a free copy of our, of our Because She's Worth It, a nutritional okay. guide for parents with daughter. Fantastic. daughter. And so we'll have, the, we'll have the digital copy, but we'll also send you a hard, a hard copy for free. Okay, so cool. 
you know, we'll take care of the shipping and everything. I just want the coaches out there to just enjoy that book and see what we're talking about when we talk about nutrition, yep. that it's basics for them and it's basics for parents. So that's and something that, that, that we want to nearly as complicated as what we talked about. No, not at all. It's very simple for parents and it just talks about the plan. It talks about what they should be eating and, you know, and even if you want to check out the reviews on Amazon, I think we've got like 30 or 40 five-star reviews on it that, you know, parents just rave about it because it's easy for them to consume and it's yeah. an easy process. Yeah. So the other thing you can find about there at gymnastcare.com forward slash shift is about how coaches can get involved too in the program and give this to their, to their athletes. So yeah. we've set up an, uh, an affiliate program for coaches so that when they share it, they can also share in the income of the, cool. of the whole process. Because I know as a as working in gymnastics, it's not a big affluent sport, right? You're not making a ton of money as a coach. Yeah. And if I can help you out that way too, yep. that's what I, I want to do that as well. So we set up that affiliate program so that you can share our master class with your parents and, mm -hmm. and also maybe earn a little bit of income for working hard and wanting to share good stuff with your parents. Yeah. Sweet. And then the other option too, that, you know, we, we have kind of, you have the online course, like you said, but you also do some traveling and live seminars and we're mm -hmm. in the process of setting up one up for our gym in June. And I think it's going to be something that's, you know, it's from my experiences, and you might have changed the seminar, so I don't want to speak and put words in your mouth, but it's, it's good because you kind of divide and conquer. You have like a talk with the parents separately. You have a talk with the athletes separately. And like you said, we had that in our gym where you came and some of the little ones were like, you know, off to lunch by 30 minutes, no pun intended yeah. again. Um, but it's, it's a good, like, it's not too long. It's super helpful information and you deliver the right information to the right audience, I guess. So that part is you right. can have a conversation with everybody and everybody's on board with the coaches, but then you can talk about you know, maybe the parents need to hear about like, how do you shop? How do you cook? The kids hear about like, you know, how do you take care of yourself? How do you eat? Yeah. And you can just send me a, a message at doc at gymnastcare.com or any of the social media sites. You can just shoot me a message there too. If you want to have a seminar about that. Yeah. And hopefully when you come up to in June, we can, we can film some content and get it out to people. So they got a, like a glimpse if they're, maybe it's not going to happen because the season's so crazy right now, but like maybe in the summer next year, we'll get some footage up for people. Absolutely. Yeah. That'd be fun. Cool, man. Anything else you can share? Wisdom. No, I think that's, the other thing is uh, the only other thing I wanted to cover that real quick that we didn't talk about is yes. landing protocol. Cause yeah. I know that's one of my big things is that, is that I know there's a lot of shift back to, to really pushing the landing straight legged yeah. or landing in that funky gymnastics position. Yeah. It's the, it's the only sport that teaches kids to land that way. Mm. And I think that yeah. and we don't have to talk about this today. Maybe this is for the next topic, but Hey, let's just think about, Let's, Let's get in that, teach our kids to land in that good squatted type position. And did you stay see the study that just came out from uh, IJSPT? I did not see it. Yeah. yeah so this is, uh, I wrote about this online, but uh, last month, I think it is. So 30 elite gymnasts from uh, the UK, they had them, they first tested maximal lumbar range of motion flexion. Ah, I did see that. I did see that. Yeah. And they had them simulate a squat landing to a, a preferred depth and everyone yep. almost landed near, like, I think it was like a percentage near end range of their maximal spinal extension. Yes. So elite gymnasts in a simulated task when they said like, just land how you would land, were landing in like massive anterior pelvic tilt. But yep. I just thought it was good because so much of the research comes out on how that landing style is very, very dangerous for knee, ACL, meniscus, and ankle yes. health. And now we have like, the full complete picture of low back. you know low back yeah. and i know they're teaching it and the only reason why i bring it up to your audience is i know that the the elite the elite coaches with usa gymnastics are teaching the wrong landing position maybe not all of them but yeah. i know in clinics i've seen videos from it just this past year yeah. and so we got to think about this as a protection mechanism and landing was one of my big things i've been pushing it for nine years now yeah. how to how to land properly yeah and so we got to get back to thinking about that and when you see that call them out on it and yeah. and let them know hey this isn't the way that dave and josh teach our gymnasts to land mm. Like this is an abnormal landing position and you're putting their back under stress and you're putting their knees under stress yep. and the whole body. And, and there's a, there's a good differential here that always comes up to me is that there's a difference between gymnastics specific shapes and landing mechanics that every athlete should use. Right. So yes. in gymnastics, we have um, bounding or, or like plyometric stiffness. Like you see mm -hmm. them do like a, a front layout, front layout or a, right. a punching off the, uh, the springboard. That's not what we're talking about with landing mechanics. Landing mechanics is for, absorbing dismounts and landings and things like that trying to preference the hamstrings glute and core in a proper like you know 
hip dominant position versus like when you're bounding on the springs, you would use more of a straight body position. And Nick Ruddick has really good resources for the differences between these two things because he's been able to teach elite athletes across the world in multiple countries. This is how you bound and punch to stay safe. This is how you land to stay safe. And we've, him and I have combined our ideas on this along with what you've done. So there's, there's a very clear difference there between uh, I'm stiff and I'm pound, pound, pounding, P- punching, punching, punching. <laughs> uh, even too also with like flip shapes, right? So like an extreme hollow position in a double back for a tuck to get a flip around is what you need, but you have to understand how to get back to a proper neutral spine, hip dominant landing position like that, which is why this is so important to train because you need to go from shape changing arch hollow to a proper landing pattern really quick. But you also need to go from like, you know, a very stiff position to a proper landing position really quick. Athletes need to know extreme hollow, extreme arch, and extreme neutral protected, right? Would that be a good way to summarize? Absolutely. Yep. And a lot of times we do that through stressing the athlete, at least for the landing position, maybe not necessarily in all the ways that we think about in gymnastics. So we teach them how to squat properly yep. and maybe to load their squat. And, yep. and we can teach them how to be under stress and achieve yep. these shapes. I, I did a podcast on our podcast with Emily Spiegel too. Yep. And she did, a, she did a really cool one. We just talked about that, about the foot position and mm-hmm. ways to get started there and move it up the body, which was a lot of fun to talk about. But, yep. but, that, uh, but yeah, I just think that that's an, an important topic that we got to just keep on people's mind, especially as it kind of tries to move away from what we've talked about for five years. Because I know I've kind of I've boycotted the USA Gymnastics National Congress and stopped speaking there. But we still have to get that information out to coaches. And we yeah, don't want absolutely. them to to think that, oh, oh, we're going back to the old way. No, yeah. we're not. Yeah. You know, we don't want to get there. And I remember our first seminar, people almost threw tomatoes at us when we did that yeah. in 2014. Yep. And, and when you're teaching a kid too, it looks ugly. <laughs> yeah. First, for the first, like, little boy that couldn't squat. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was like, that was brutal to watch, but you got it. Do you know what I, I've been doing? And this is my 20% to my, to my 80% results for my landing technique is that, and you kind of got me started down this, down this kind of journey of breathing technique. Yep. And what I do is if a kid can't squat, I just have them, check their breathing first. I have them lay on their back. And my favorite way to do it is I just have them have one hand on their chest, one hand on their belly. And I have them close their eyes, knees bent, just super relaxed. And I have them go on vacation. Mm. And I'm like, hey, where's your favorite place to go on vacation? And they're like, oh, the beach with my mom. So I'm like, all right, you're at the beach. You hear the waves crashing. And then, you know, your favorite band is playing in the background. And all of a sudden their face just goes from the sympathetic response to parasympathetic, just relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. And they just completely chill out yeah. and they start diaphragmatically breathing. Yep. Yeah. And I let them breathe for 30 seconds and someone will start yawning. <clears throat> they'll start yawning and they'll start just chilling out, almost mm. falling asleep. Mm. And, and then I'm like, do you feel how you're breathing right now? They're like, yeah. I'm like, that's how we breathe when we do a squat or we move around yeah. because it's a, it's a great diaphragmatic breath and it's how we initiate our core. Yeah. So then they stand up, they breathe, and then they do a perfect squat. Yeah. Nine times out of ten. Just to chill sometimes is all they need, right? Yep. And yeah. those are the kind of, I guess this is a combination of both of what we've taught and what we've learned about is there's kind of three aspects, right? There's positional awareness, which is what we just talked about. Mm-hmm. There's the ability to breathe well, and then there's the ability to brace, right? There's the ability to use the canister as a unit. And when mm-hmm. we say why bracing is so important, why neutral is important, is because it's like a soup can where the top is the diaphragm, the bottom is the pelvic floor, you have the stuff around there. But if you find neutral and you breathe and brace properly, there's a lot of reflexive recruitment of the deeper, smaller spinal muscles that stabilize individual, individual vertebral bodies. And we're not going to go into that, but that's, that's why it's so important because like the big global phasic muscles that are like what we see brace the outside. But then if we breathe properly and we have good alignment, the canister can co- tolerate pressure in all directions and the smaller muscles around the spine also are activated, which prevent, you know, shearing and buckling and things like that, which, you know, that is the, I think the peak velocity of takeoff forces of a double back is like nine and the landing forces are 14. So you think about like how crazy that is, like the tibiotalar joint takes 23 times bone on bone ground reaction forces. So like that's going through you every time you land good or bad. So you have to try to protect yourself optimally, you know? Yep. And then we could get in that whole, so we talked about the top side of the core I think it was episode 31 of the Gymnast Care Podcast. We talked with an expert on pelvic floor. Mm, yep. And that was, she just, she blew my mind on that one, but yeah. ways to build pelvic floor health. Yeah. That was good. I was very surprised, but she had a really good way of like describing that. I remember that. 
Yep. Yeah. She's a, she's a rock star on that. So yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to get that last little bit out. Cause that's my, that's been one of my passions in gymnastics yeah. is, is changing the way people land. And I think we've seen some really good results on that, like with some rule changes, yep. but we just don't want the, we don't want these coaches that are, that are out there doing clinics yep. to send us back into the dark ages on yep. some of these injuries. Yep. Yeah. So with that in mind, if people, as, as the parting gift, I guess I should say, is like core controls, we got that down. How should people, how do you want, how do we want people to land in an optimal dismount or landing strategy? Well, it, and it's got to be a development, developmental process, right? But they kind of go into, a, into what I would think of as a squat looking position. So yep. if you were to put a bar on someone and watch them squat, that's kind of the same position that you want them to do, but they've got to have, they have to have optimal is somewhere around 30 percent of hip flexion right yep. and then they're having knee bend and your you have joint displacement which allows the muscles to eccentrically contract they're they're elongating but they're contracting and they're absorbing all the pressure that you're putting into them yep. so if you just think of someone just just coming down perfectly controlled toe ball heel into knee and hip flexion yep. and in a neutral spine like you said that's one of the big things yeah, and, when you, and the marker you can use too is when you, the ACL research for sure is that when you look at the angle of the trunk from the side, yes. the tibial angle, yes. is that relatively parallel, right? So 30 degrees of hip flexion will give you a, about a tibial angle and you want to see those things moving in concert versus if someone's upright in their torso, their tibial angle is going to be a, an intersecting line, not parallel. So from the side, you can look at that and if ankles are stiff or if hips are stiff and there's a big arch in your back, you can kind of start to reverse engineer screening out ankle mobility or core control, things like that. But that's what you're looking for from the side is angular displacement, okay. eccentric contraction for the glutes hamstrings, but then also parallel angles. Yep. And, and then, then the front. yeah. Yeah. Just making sure that the, there's no valgus stress with the knees. So the knees aren't coming together. They're not going out. Yep. And that uh, one of the big things too, I see with hip dysfunction is you'll see almost a wobble with the knee on yep. one side. Yep. You'll see like a, and I think that that's where the getting a little nerdy, but that's where the, where the femoral neck is trying to clear the acetabulum. Yeah. I think you get a little wobble in there, but I, at that same time, I think you're doing a lot of damage to the lower back mm. in that process because you're not getting full glute control yeah. of the lower extremity. So I think that's one of the things just to look for. Maybe they have to land with their toes just out a little bit. Mm. It's not, maybe they can't do a, yeah. a strictly straight ahead. So something to look at. As you yeah. think about from the front. But also to go, linking that back to the study we just talked about, the more anterior pelvic tilt you have, the more, again, yeah. nerdy, if you're not nerdy, black out. But if you have more anterior pelvic tilt, you're going to drive femoral neck internal rotation, which is, which is valgus, right? So like right. the more overextended, you drive IR, along with FAI issues, you're probably going to have more, you know, you put your glutes and your pelvis at a huge mechanical disadvantage because they're so internally rotated that your, your external rotators and your glutes can no longer tolerate maintaining the force vector into external rotation. So that's the problem that the, that's how core control and position of awareness up top correlates to knee valgus and ACLs and, and Achilles injuries too, because then you have pronation and Achilles shearing on the medial side. Yeah. Yep. And that's, that's where you get, get back to that stuff Emily was talking about too, which is kind of cool. The, uh, uh, and I don't know if you knew this, but we were sitting, I think we were sitting outside of a uh, Panera and I, like, I think we had just got coffee. I think we were in Michigan. Yep. <clears throat> and, and we had a long weekend and I, I was just asking you about soldiers when they ruck march, when they put a, oh, yeah. put a second and that like, that sent me down like six months. Cause sometimes it takes me a little while to process what you say. So, <laughs> uh, but that took me down like six months and I was, I was like just figuring out what happens with that anterior pelvic tilt yeah, and how that can even more affect the, the, um, the, the femoral neck and the acetabulum, how they come together and create damage yep. at the labrum and different other anterior tissues. Yep. But that, that one, I mean, and the sentence was, you said it just offhandedly. I don't even think you like, you're just like, whatever, Eldridge, this is what's happening. And so you said it offhandedly, but it, um, it's really had a big impact on thousands of soldiers lives. Oh so my God. I'm on that, thank you. Yeah. I'm so blessed. a lot of the dudes that were able to get in there and talk about hip uh, dysfunction, Yep. and be able to address how they're moving and mm -hmm. their core strength deficiencies. Like that's, that's been big and we've gotten people back out in the fight that have even been in Afghanistan just the last little bit because of, I was able to understand that better. So wow, that's crazy. some of this stuff is, is big, bigger than maybe even you think that's going on. People that are out there working hard for right now. That's incredible. Yeah. 
I'm so, flattered. Yeah, so cool. Yep, so again, just so people know, gymnastcare.com forward slash shift, and that's where they yeah. can find those resources. Yeah, and we'll probably, we'll cut this podcast up into two, like maybe a landing chunk into that so people can kind of All get right. it. But cool. Yeah, and I'll put some resources up too for the landing stuff. We have some articles we've both written, so. Nice. Nice. All right, man. Thank you so much for your time. It's good to connect. And uh, thanks for all the work you do because I'd be lost without the nutrition stuff. <laughs> I love it. And I'm just glad to see kids starting to change and the sport starting to change. Yeah. I think it's kind of like, it's fun because there are a couple other PTs that came and heard me at that first Congress. And it makes me feel good when they say stuff like, like, uh, hey, because of what you talked about that one time, you know, I moved on and you're doing way more stuff than than I'm doing and so are those other PTs that are they're that taking it to a whole nother level so it kind of makes me feel good as like the grandpa so <laughs> yeah well it's all it's all a cumulative snowball right like no one yeah. person is is going to change it all no one person's going to blow it all so it's it's a matter sure. of way but I remember man it's you get in the weeds sometimes of the stuff and like when we started in 2013 there was like the 14 15 years I'm like what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Why am I spending so much time doing this? But then you get a couple of stories that come out like this. or you look back six years ago and you're like, all right, man, like just keep chipping away at it. Just keep chipping away at it. Like we're, and it's, it's finally, it's, it's changing, which is good. You know, we're seeing a tectonic change in the way gymnastics is done. And I think five years from now, we're going to have a very different um, sport, you know, uh, same sport, different approach, a very yeah. much, which is good, which is promising to hear. And I'm excited to see gymnastics not be a little kid sport. To yeah. see it be an adult sport, yep. and and we can kind of train these kids properly, but it doesn't. We don't have to think about, hey, by thirteen you have to be an elite. Yeah, you know that's that's absurd because now you got now you, you have at least three years of being an elite, and then if you want to make it to college, which a lot of these athletes are doing, you're looking at you know nine, ten years of being an elite. That's just it's crazy. But if we can if we can start pushing these athletes to to being older and more mature and more control of themselves, we're going to see a lot better gymnastics i think yep. and we're gonna see a lot of a lot of healthier gymnasts yeah and whether that happens right whether athletes go to elite and they have more years in elite or some that have, have chosen this path is to just maybe defer going to college by a couple of years and, and you know start to really hit their stride by 16 17 have a couple of years at elite and then go back to school at like 20 you know mm -hmm. that's completely starting you know freshman year is 20 is, is very very normal these days which is cool but that allows 20 to 24 to be an extra four years after your 18 to 20 you know, maybe two years spurt of elite that you have. So when Absolutely. you're clearly more developed, powerful, cognitively sound, and you have more years under your belt of building the foundation to tolerate such a demanding sport. Yep. Cool, man. Yeah. All right. Well, this was great. I thank you for your time, and uh, we'll get this chopped up and put it out pretty quick. All right. Thanks, Dave. I do. See you. All right. Talk to you later.